the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS Studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. And you are listening to the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. I'm Kevin Wade. It is Monday, the 25th of... uh, January, the post blizzard show. And as always on Mondays, I am delighted to be joined in the radio studio by none other than our show's founder and inspirational leader, Rick Trader. Kevin, great to be with you again. Yes, and welcome to Snowmageddon. They weren't too far off on their predictions. They, the, the storm actually shifted a little farther west than what they anticipated. What When I say they weren't too far off on their predictions, uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is maybe about 70 miles north of Philadelphia, was expecting two to five inches of snow. Well, they turned out to be the grand puja of snow. They got about 32 inches. <laughs> well, there's plenty of snow for everybody. I yes. mean, it, 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 if you're disappointed in getting 10 uh, trust me, that's plenty. Uh, we probably had 15 where I live mm-hmm. uh, at the bend in the river on the Delaware. And uh, it, it, it was snowing and it was blowing. Uh, the wind was nonstop. It was, we were talking before that the mics got turned on. I have a shutter, the second store of my house, wood shutters, real wood shutters with a little retainer clasps. And, and that shutter hasn't moved since President McKinley was in office. And I woke up uh, Saturday morning to, to, to notice that the front bedroom was very dark, and that's because a shutter had mm-hmm. swung around. Not only did it swing around, it apparently was flapping in the winds through the night because it broke my storm window, which has to be replaced. A uh, branch came down in the backyard, drifts of snow. It was a long-running, severe storm. And, but there was, there was uh, you know, a silver side to, to that cloud, and I'll be talking a little bit about that in my commentary after our first break, Rick. Yeah, well, it was pretty exciting. I'm still one of these people that love to see it snow. We only got about a foot of snow. And just, I would say, just about six or seven miles north as the crow flies from our house is Philadelphia International Airport. And reportedly, they got 22 inches of snow. So somebody owes me. Somebody owes me 10 inches of snow. You come over to my place, you can take all you want. Well, Kevin, I'm a little bit surprised. You can take all you want because I had all I could handle on Saturday shoveling uh, the first of the snow. While it was snowing, I'm still shoveling. While it's blowing, I'm shoveling, just trying to make a head start. Uh, It continued to snow after I finished, and there was another three inches uh, the next morning, Sunday morning when I came out. But at least the wind had died down. Well, Kevin, i got to be honest with you. I'm a little surprised that you're even out if you got if you got 15 inches of snow i've been to your house beautiful area old newcastle delaware it looks like a real colonial williamsburg to me but the streets are very narrow they're one way people park on both sides of them i don't know how they plow the streets in newcastle if you get 15 inches of snow one of the sides of those streets those cars has got to be plowed into june uh, the problem, I mean, you can take your shovel out, as I and my neighbors were doing on, on, on Saturday and, and then a long time on Sunday, and you can pick up the snow in your shovel, and then the next test <laughs> is where do you put it? Mm-hmm. See, there is no extended driveway, no, there's large not. expanse of lawn, there's no grove of trees. I mean, everything is kind of packed together. It's very quaint. Mm-hmm. But once you pick the snow up, you have to be very careful where you put it down, and people are very territorial. I've got, I've got my six feet of snow piled up in front of the windows in my house, but I really can't deal with anyone else's six feet piled up on top of that. Or I wouldn't have any daylight. Now, Kevin, um, you and your, your bride, Gail, probably parked in front of your house. Is that correct? Exactly. We have a strategic and, way of parking yeah. in advance of a big storm. Okay. And you 
you shoveled yourself out because you are here today. I don't know about about Mrs. Wade if she went to work today. I shoveled her out. Every okay. one of my street is shoveled out. We had teams of shovelers. Now, my question, did you put a lawn chair in your spot to, to protect it? I don't have to. <laughs> the entire street knows that spot belongs to either Kevin or Gail. Okay. so no, And I know the spot further down and further. I know who they belong to. Yeah. Only so, an interloper without estate plates. Mm-hmm. Most usually New Jersey plates, to be quite honest, would steal another man's parking space after he spent four and five hours of shoveling. Well, you know, in Philadelphia, tradition has it when they have these big snows. People will shovel out their spot and then put lawn chairs or barbecues or orange cones in front of to protect their territory, the territory that they shoveled out. And they've made that illegal now in Philadelphia. You can get a ticket if you do that. Well, when the mayor of Philly wants to go to the streets of South Philly and start shoveling people out, then he can set the rules about where you park. But it truly is a multi-hour endeavor. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it with your neighbors and you're trying to make some sense out of where to put the snow. And you make sure that everyone gets uh, unstuck, everyone gets shoveled out. And you come up with kind of a... The wisdom of the community, the neighborhood, or at least the street comes together to figure out where to put the snow to cause the least interference with anyone's life. But everyone gets shoveled out. Mm -hmm. But there are no extra spaces. I mean, some of the some of the spots that could be spaces for parking cars are now eight feet high with shoveled snow. They were like sacrificial parking spots. (laughs) So anyone who had their car there at the start of the storm has a place at the end of the storm, but we simply can't have other people climb into the lifeboat. Yeah. It's kind of like the southern border. Mm-hmm. We have our hands full. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, here in, in New Jersey, we are very glad that our governor decided to join us during this blizzard. I uh, remember, and I think it was uh, 2010, 2010, I believe it was, we got a big snowstorm here in New Jersey. It was right after, not too f- too long after Chris Christie was inaugurated. And he and his wife were at, at Disney World in Florida. He, his wife, his family has like three kids. And he refused to come back to New Jersey to handle the snow management situation. And he even said at that time, uh, I'm here in Florida. There's nothing that I can do in New Jersey. And I'd much rather be here in Florida. And then he says he wouldn't change. He would not change his his. Uh, his plan you know he wasn't coming back to jersey well this year he was campaigning in new hampshire for the presidency and at first he said no i'm not coming back to jersey but somebody must have got in his ear because he did come back and his uh, it was so wonderful that he graced our presence this time and lived through the blizzard with us well, maybe you heard there's going to be more snow in New Hampshire than there was in Jersey and was afraid you'd get roped into shoveling there. I don't know. I don't know. But the good news is in Sayreville, New Jersey. I know it well. I was just there visiting not six weeks ago. Sayreville, New Jersey, they had an ordinance that uh, last year a couple industrious teenagers like Mateo, like Mateo went out. Well, Mateo wasn't one of them, but a couple of industrious teenagers like Mateo went out shoveling. Well, they didn't get such a great reception from the police. The police stopped them and told them that they were in violation of some ordinance that uh, in order to go door to door to get snow shoveling jobs, they would have to be get a permit and that permit would be four hundred and fifty dollars. Anyway, anyway, the the wonderful fathers of Sayreville, New Jersey, actually suspended that suspended that requirement for industrious teenagers who wanted to shovel snow through this blizzard. So if you want to make money, you want to go to Sayreville, New Jersey, you will not have to buy a $450 license to shovel snow. Well, I'll tell you, if you were a teenager yes. in, in my neighborhood... I used to be one. You could, you, you, could have, you could have banked some money by the end of the day on Sunday. You could have, you could have put away 1500 bucks by the end of the day. Uh-huh. Okay, and as far as I'm concerned... I'm not telling the IRS where you got it, okay? <laughs> so, so you're free and clear. That's under the table. That's cash. But, but he, the here's table. here's the philosophical question about Sayreville, New Jersey, which I just visited six weeks ago. I had a heck of a time visiting some wonderful people. 
What possessed the town fathers to pass such an ordinance to begin with? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, half these ordinances, Kevin, do, do not make sense. For instance, we've heard stories about kids with a lemonade stand that the police have shut them down, bake sales that have been shut down by the police or some governmental organization but uh, i'm glad i'm glad that the that the teenagers of sayreville new jersey had the opportunity they got a lot of snow up there kevin so not only did they get a lot of snow but the the city fathers fathers in their great wisdom suspended the ordinance that it would that you needed a license to go door to door to get snow shoveling jobs. Well, let me give a heads up notice to the to the town fathers of Sayreville who might be listening. Come to grips with people cutting the lawns in the summertime. Get a head start mm-hmm. on that thing, okay? Because some of those same 17 and 15 and 14 year olds were shoveling this weekend. They might be pushing a lawnmower come June and July. You want to get ahead of that one? Yes, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Someone said we get the government that we deserve. Yeah. Elections do have consequences, and this is, is, we see it every day. We see it each and every day. Hey, uh, Ken McClinton was my co-host on Friday. Oh, yeah, my, my good friend, Ken. Our good buddy, Ken. And he was saying that on Thursday night, you know, Washington, like the rest of it, got rest of us got blasted with this storm. But Thursday night, Washington got an inch of snow which clogged all the streets and kept Barack Obama from getting to his appointed rounds. And I made the comment to Ken at that time, wow, this is probably good. I After this blizzard, he can't get to his office for the next month. Well, I actually saw a comment uh, talking about the weather in Washington, mm. saw it over the weekend, saying that uh, you know, the government was closed on Friday because of the weather. And the comment was, if they just keep it closed until January 2017, we have a fighting chance. Yes, we do. Hey, Kevin, now, before we go to the break, uh, tease us a little bit. Do you have a commentary for me? I have a commentary, and it talks about community, and it talks about weather, and it's titled, Just Pick Up a Shovel and Do It. And it's an analogy for the problems in our communities All these right. days. It sounds like you wrote this over the weekend while you were snowed in. I wrote it as I was recuperating from the work of digging out a two car spaces in conjunction with my neighbors. And I, mean, I can't tell you how much work we did, but we got a lot done. We are coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia. And around the world on the internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, Rebooting Liberty Radio, and AM slash FM 24 slash 7. They all end in dot com. My name ends in Wade. His name ends in Trader. You stay with us. We will be right back. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We are establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired of the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on WNJC Radio. 1960 on your AM dial or around the world on the internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our website, CCRSNetwork.com, for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where now even more newsmakers go to be heard. Hi, this is Bob Vide, owner of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassboro, New Jersey. I've had the opportunity to travel in many foreign countries, and I've seen what happens to people when they lose their freedom. I wrote this poem. Give us freedom was the cry as they marched throughout the night at Concord Bridge in Trenton for freedom they would fight. 
To build a nation that would last with peace and liberty, it is a job that's never done if we are to be free. They wrote a declaration to announce that we are free, then a constitution for all the world to see. But this is ink on paper. We must make it last. It must always be defended, and that is quite a task. Today, the battle rages for freedom in our land. To save our constitution, we all must take a stand. We must stand up for freedom in our actions every day, and you can stand up with us. Join the NRA. This is Bob Biden of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassboro, New Jersey. You may call us at area code 856-881-7575 or visit us online at bobslittlesportshop.com. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS Studios. WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856 856- 227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. He is, and you are. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our websites, www.ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com. For mornings at 9 a.m., log on to Leading Edge Radio Network. Or at 1 p.m., log on to RoarRadio.net, R-O-A-R Radio.net. And at 9 p.m., log on to HighPlainsDailyNews.com. And, of course, you can listen to the conservative commandos from any telephone anywhere on the planet by calling 832-999-1199. I'm Kevin Wade. It's Monday. Co-hosting with me is none other than Rick Trader. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to be in the studio. It's great to be in the studio. I thought well, it might be snowed in. As I said, Kevin, I... I've called you this morning to just, just to see if you were coming in today. I gave you the option of doing the show from home over the telephone. I didn't want you to think that you had to shovel yourself out to get here, but it's great to see you here. Hey, it's uh, it's Monday, and it's that time, uh, 3, uh, 18, 319, uh, where uh, I do my uh, Monday commentary. Mm-hmm. Title is Just Pick Up a Shovel and Do It. Last week, a low-pressure system wandered across the meteorological maps of North America. It dipped into the Southlands before being caught up and swept northeast by the jet stream. At the same time, a cold north and northwest wind set in blowing cold Canadian air across the eastern half of the U.S. As the low-pressure cell moved up the coast, it intensified into a raging nor'easter, dumping feet of snow. Fierce and constant winds howled for more than 24 hours as the storm set about to interrupt life for 70 million people between Charlotte and New Haven. As the wind ebbed and the snow subsided, neighbors emerged, bundled against the chill and shovels in hand to get to the work of digging out. As always happens, the good people of all the affected communities came together to get things done by helping one another. Teams shoveled where the work was too much for one. Groups of men helped someone stuck in his car due to too much snow and too little tread on the tires. Younger people helping elderly, wives and daughters delivering coffee and hot cocoa to their helpful and hardworking neighbors. There was a lot of sharing, sharing the work, sharing the shovels, sharing the broom, sharing the salt, Sharing the jumper cables and in other places sharing snow blowers and someone's blade mounted pickup truck. Most importantly, people were sharing life together, facing its difficulties, and by working together, working through those difficulties, through those feet of snow, making things better for everyone. That low pressure system and Nor'easter did more to bring people together than any politician or government program ever could. And maybe that's the lesson for all of us. People know what is wrong about, people know what is wrong without someone's expert opinion. They know what to do without a governing council. They know how to do it without a federal training program or a license of certification. 
If we waited for instructions from Washington or directions from Dover or Trenton or Harrisburg, we'd still be up to our backsides in snow. People, certainly the American people, will know what needs to be done and how to do it. Generally, the people also find the most effective and efficient way to get it done. So when you look at the large issues before our country, the things more long-lasting than a winter snowstorm, maybe we can draw the same conclusion about whether we should wait for the government experts or just do it. When a small business wants to expand and build and hire, let's not force delays through thoughtless permits and senseless impact statements. Let's get government out of the way and just do it. We need the jobs. When a community wants to improve local schools, involve the teachers and the local parents. Keep Washington's experts and their common core on a leash and away from our kids. We need educated and well-prepared citizens, so let's just do it. The overarching message in the American experience for 200 years and the recent weekend blizzard is the same. People do best when they are free and unhindered to react and overcome what affects us all. There is a can-do attitude to make things better and better quickly that always succeeds if you get big government out of the way. You just have to pick up a shovel, stand with your neighbors and your entire community and just do it. I'm Kevin Wade. That's the way I see it. Well, Kevin Wade, I saw exactly what you're talking about in action, not just in this past blizzard, but several years ago when a hurricane came up the coast. Yesterday, well, I w- it, it seems like weather, bad weather like this actually brings people closer together. Um, yesterday, while I was shoveling snow at, out of our driveway... Our neighbors come out. Steve was there. Pat was there. Rick was there. Uh, Mark was there. And we were having a conversation in the middle of the street, <laughs> which would never happen at any time, any other time. I can remember a few years ago when we had a hurricane, the year before Sandy, the hurricane before Sandy. I forget the name of it. But at that time, when everybody's lights was out, when everybody's basements were flooded it was the neighbors that got together with the community fire company that pumped everybody's basement out made sure everybody was taken care of the government was nowhere around you know what fema does when they come to a disaster scene they pass out business cards and loan (laughs) applications and then they leave if you're cold wet and hungry when fema arrives You'll be cold, wet, and hungry when they leave. You'll just have a business card and a loan application. Well, It's always neighbors helping neighbors. Not only does it make sense, but it works, and that's the way we do it here. And not only that, the people that had snow plows, Kevin, they went up and down the street and made sure the people that didn't have, like snow blowers, made sure that their driveways were open, made sure that their sidewalks were open. Something about weather. Something about these weather phenomena that bring people together. But I think it brings out the best in people. It brings out the best in people. I saw a quick uh, little news item about, uh, about a woman living alone. Her husband was, is deployed and her heater failed mm-hmm. in the midst of the storm. So she called an uh, H&V company to send a technician out to see what the heck was going on. This guy comes out, an older guy, and he finds the problem. He fixes the problem. He hears a bit about her story. And when he, sub- when he hands her the bill, it says, uh, courtesy, $1, because he knew that she was by herself and money was going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. So for $1, he fixes the heater problem. He was in, the story got circulated through social media. A newspaper called him and he said his grandfather used to deliver milk mm. during the Depression. And his job was to pick up the cost of that milk every time you dropped a bottle off at a home. But his grandfather said sometimes he went into a home and there were a bunch of kids and a baby screaming and the mom had no money and he would just set the milk on the table. So he said, this is my turn to just set the milk on the table. Well, Kevin, sometimes people just have to take care of each other. Stop depending on government. You know, if you depend upon if you depend upon government, you're going to wait a long time for help. But if you need your neighbor, they're always there. And they're there right when you need them. Absolutely. They're not asking you to fill out a form or take a business card and call them next week. Nope. 
Hey, Rick, I think we're coming up on uh, the end of the first half hour. Uh, we'll come back and then quickly talk about uh, who our guests are and uh, then get underway with our first interview as we do. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia. And around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, Rebooting Liberty Radio, and AM FM 24-7. They all end in .com. You are listening to WNJC. You stay with us. We'll be right back in 5 minutes and 38 seconds. You've heard Paul Deltz playing the music on the Your Music Matters Morning Show. He is also an experienced mortgage loan officer working for U.S. Mortgage Corporation and assists homeowners navigate the reverse mortgage process. If you are finding yourself asking questions whether or not you set aside enough for retirement, Paul can sit down with you, your family, and your financial advisor and discuss how a reverse mortgage may be a valuable resource for your retirement plan. You will be responsible for paying your taxes and insurance, and the reverse mortgage can help with this and other expenses, such as home health care or other untimely bills. Put Paul's 20 20 plus years of experience to work for you as choosing the right option for your situation can be critical. Call Paul at U.S. Mortgage Corporation at 877-213-9977. That's 877-213-9977. Or go to SeniorMatters.info for more information. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is a licensed mortgage banker in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and an equal housing lender. NMLS number 3901. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is located at 201 Old Country Road, Suite 140, Melville, New York, 11747. This advertisement applies to First Lee Mortgages. Paul E. Dilks, NMLS is 485. Hi, this is Bob Vi, owner of Boswell's Sports Shop in Glassburn, New Jersey. I've had the opportunity to travel in many foreign countries, and I've seen what happens to people when they lose their freedom. I wrote this poem. Give us freedom was the cry as they marched throughout the night at Concord Bridge in Trenton for freedom they would fight. To build a nation that would last with peace and liberty, it is a job that's never done if we are to be free. They wrote a declaration to announce that we are free, then a constitution for all the world to see. But this is ink on paper. We must make it last. It must always be defended, and that is quite a task. Today the battle rages for freedom in our land. To save our constitution, we all must take a stand. We must stand up for freedom in our actions every day, and you can stand up with us. Join the NRA. This is Bob Biden of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassburn, New Jersey. You may call us at area code 856-881-7575 or visit us online at bobslittlesportshop.com. What does it take to be the leader in production systems technology? To be the one company that solves production problems at any plant, for any product, and with any technology? It takes a 30-year record of success. It takes total mastery of complex technologies with a history of delivering success every time, without fail. Only one company can claim that high ground in manufacturing line optimization, data automation, and systems integration, and that's Philadelphia Control Systems. In factories worldwide, Philadelphia Control Systems programs, software, and engineering solutions deliver optimal performance and output flow with a record that can't be matched. Any plant, any product, any technology. Philadelphia Control Systems, the leader in production automation since 1982. 800-335-9811. PCS4Automation.com. That's PCS, the number four, automation.com. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We're establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired as I am about the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 a.m. or around the world on the internet at wnjcradio.com check out our websites conservative commandos radio network.com and ccrn.com for rebroadcasts and network updates we are the conservative commandos radio network where even more newsmakers go to be heard from the east coast to the West Coast, 
and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Thank you, Colonel West. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our websites, www.ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com or mornings at 9 a.m. log on to Leading Edge Radio Network. At 1 p.m. log on to roararradio.net, R-O-A-R radio.net. And at 9 p.m. log on to highplainsdailynews.com. And you can listen to the conservative commandos from any telephone by calling 832-999-1199. I'm Kevin Wade. I'm in the studio with our show's uh, founder and inspirational leader, Rick Trader. And... uh, we're kicking off the week with a recurring guest, a great guest, in fact. Daniel Horowitz is uh, the senior editor of Conservative Review. He has previously worked with and written for the Madison Project and Red State and Breitbart, and those are three of my favorites. And he's here today to talk about, well, Roe v. Wade, 58 million reasons to reclaim America from the courts. And with that, welcome to the Conservative Commanders Radio Show, Daniel Horowitz. Hey, it's great to be back with you, even though I'm st- stuck here in my little igloo in central Maryland. <laughs> well, there's a lot of little igloos these days, uh, but we managed to get into the big igloo with a, with a broadcast tower, and uh, we're glad you're with us as well. And, and if, if you're not shoveling snow, either being a guest or listening to this show is the best thing you can do with your time. Oh, for sure. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm so glad to get out, out from the cold and shoveling. I'm already Charlie Horse. How much snow did you get in your neck of, uh, of the Great Republic? We got 30 inches. I mean, we, we've never seen anything like this. Well, God willing, you may not see it again in the near future. <laughs> you, uh, you, you'll have snow until June. I'm telling you, yeah, and with the global warming, you just never know because they say the warmer it gets, the more it snows. <laughs> well, and they also say the warmer it gets, the less snow. So, I mean, they basically have it covered, and, and, and we're, we're, we're cornered in a room with no corners, thanks to Al Gore, that clever guy. Uh, but I'll let our listeners decide whether this is the hand of global warming or just uh, seasonal weather to an extreme once in a while. Daniel, 58 million reasons to reclaim America from the courts. Walk us through this, if you would. Sure. So obviously this was my post, you know, for the 43rd anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which was Friday when everyone was focusing on the snow and likely forgot about this grim milestone. And, you know, whenever you talk about abortion, a lot of people just discuss the policy and they get into the fact that, you know, we've had 58 million abortions since 1973. But what I focused on here was the, the court, the judiciary. I mean, at its heart, that's what we're looking back on with the Roe v. Wade decision. And the point is, even more than the 58 million abortions that took place, it's that we can't even have a debate about it because of the courts. And that is the point. A lot of people forget if Roe v. Wade is overturned, it doesn't mean abortion is banned. It means like any other political or societal question that is not discussed in the Constitution, which it's not, it's left to the states. And, you know... (laughs) You're, you're going to debate it in the states. What we have, what, what was so tragic about this decision, even more so than the babies, which is a pretty big deal, was our entire system of governance was thrown upside down. In that decision, the court made it clear that they are now the final arbiter of all societal political questions. And that undermines our republic as, as a democratic republic where at its heart the legislature predominates and through elected represent, representation we debate these issues and we implement public policy you know and, and this is what has led to all the decisions we have nowadays forcing states to recognize a gay marriage i mean that's a political question that needs to be decided in the states um you know just today as we're talking the supreme court handed down another ruling 
basically overturning all criminal laws and states sentencing juvenile murderers to life in prison without parole and and invalidating them retroactively. So in other words, they, they could potentially offer several thousand people in this country uh, retroactive parole. I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about marriage, abortion, criminal justice. These are the most fundamental decisions of our time. How could they be made by a bunch of unelected individuals that, look, let's face it, they merely reflect the political divide in the elected branches. So rather than having the same politics on unelected branches of the government where there's no remedy for the public to, you know, overturn their will, which is really nothing more than the will of the legal profession, what's ever in vogue at any given time, let's fight these issues out through a democratic process. And, you know, that is what we need to remember in, with Roe v. Wade, even more offensive than the underlying result was the process they chose to get there because we're paying for it to this day. Roe v. Wade was decided by the Supreme Court in 1973. 1973. And it is still a contentious, bitterly divisive issue. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely fair to say. And now, now, but, now let me, because I want to make a point here, Daniel. There was a time... And this, this draws the distinction between legislation, well-argued, well-reasoned, and battled out in the town square by our representatives, versus a judicial ruling. There was a time when the consumption of alcohol was the most contentious issue facing American society. Exactly. And you know what's interesting? When they, when they banned um, alcohol, you didn't have a scenario where they were like, oh, you know, let's just... Uh let's just do it through the judiciary or even the legislature. They actually went through the proper channels and they passed the constitutional amendment. Yeah, and that had to be ratified by the states and every state had their battle. And, and, when, and, and when prohibition was repealed, you had the same thing take place. And today there are different rules about alcohol in all 50 states. There might be some states that shared the same rule, but they were arrived at by individual states in a deliberative process. It is not a hot topic because it was allowed to reach a natural conclusion. And when the courts intervene, Roe v. Wade, it permanently put this, this, this uh, divisive issue in suspended animation. It can never get resolved. You're seeing this in a lot of polling data, that there's a growing sense of disquiet over this social transformation we're seeing in the country. Washington Post had a great poll in the, among independents, even among a lot of Democrats. Um, you're seeing that people being disenchanted because they are disenfranchised. Somehow the biggest decisions of our time are now stripped from the hands of the people, and that makes no sense. Th that's the point. Um, th there's, there's two reasons why judicial tyranny is problematic. I mean, number one, when, when you handle these issues through the democratic process, so th there, are, there are no such things as, as permanent victories, and, and, and the losing side could always hope to fight another day and, and convince the heart, change their hearts and minds and win, win them over and overturn it. Or, alternatively, when you work it out through the democratic process, you don't have a carte blanche, uh, just a, you know, straight up edict. You kind of work out some sort of compromise, conditions, stipulations. And this is the whole thing with the gay marriage thing. I mean, I could go on and on about the egregious nature of constitutionalizing that. But one of the major things is in order to arrive at that conclusion, they had to create a protected class um, because no, no such thing existed. And by doing that, you necessarily infringe upon the unalienable rights of everyone else, which is religious liberty. And you're seeing that with people with their private property, private businesses being fined. Kim Davis was thrown in jail. These are the type of things that even if you believe in gay marriage and even if you want to push in the political process, but you'd be able to at least work out some sort of compromise where you protect religious liberty, no such uh, arrangement can be made when you have a judicial edict. And this is why abortion is not so contentious in other countries. Look, Europe is pretty liberal, and that's where the people are, and they resolve that through their uh, elected branches of government, and, and it worked out. But, but we will never resolve that as long as we do not respect federalism. And it, it just, I'm, I'm looking back, and I want, I want to draw another juxtaposition. 
Well, Daniel, can I ask you to hold that juxtaposition until we come out on the other side of a break? I'd like to continue this conversation, but there's some things we have to attend to. Daniel? Absolutely. Capitalism is great, and uh, we all got to make money. Well, you know, I, I, I could go on forever, but let's pick this up on the other side. Daniel Horowitz is staying with us. I want you to stay with us, too. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia and around the world on the Internet at many, many places. My name's Kevin Wade. Daniel Horowitz is staying with us. You stay with us, too. We will be right back. You've heard Paul Deltz playing the music on the Your Music Matters Morning Show. He is also an experienced mortgage loan officer working for U.S. Mortgage Corporation and assists homeowners navigate the reverse mortgage process. If you are finding yourself asking questions whether or not you set aside enough for retirement, Paul can sit down with you, your family, and your financial advisor and discuss how a reverse mortgage may be a valuable resource for your retirement plan. You will be responsible for paying your taxes and insurance, and the reverse mortgage can help with this and other expenses, such as home health care or other untimely bills. Put Paul's 20 plus years of experience to work for you as choosing the right option for your situation can be critical. Call Paul at U.S. Mortgage Corporation at 877-213-9977. That's 877-213-9977. Or go to seniormatters.info for more information. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is a licensed mortgage banker in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and an equal housing lender. NMLS number 3901. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is located at 201 Old Country Road, Suite 140, Melville, New York, 11747. This advertisement applies to First Lee Mortgages. Paul E. Dilks, NMLS is 485 Hi, this is Bob Vine, owner of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassburg, New Jersey. I've had the opportunity to travel in many foreign countries, and I've seen what happens to people when they lose their freedom. I wrote this poem. Give us freedom was the cry as they marched throughout the night at Concord Bridge in Trenton for freedom they would fight. To build a nation that would last with peace and liberty, it is a job that's never done if we are to be free. They wrote a declaration to announce that we are free, then a constitution for all the world to see. But this is ink on paper. We must make it last. It must always be defended, and that is quite a task. Today the battle rages for freedom in our land. To save our constitution, we all must take a stand. We must stand up for freedom in our actions every day, and you can stand up with us. Join the NRA. This is Bob Biden of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassburg, New Jersey. You may call us at area code 856-881-7575 or visit us online at bobslittlesportshop.com. What does it take to be the leader in production systems technology? To be the one company that solves production problems at any plant, for any product, and with any technology? It takes a 30-year record of success. It takes total mastery of complex technologies with a history of delivering success every time without fail. Only one company can claim that high ground in manufacturing line optimization, data automation, and systems integration, and that's Philadelphia Control Systems. In factories worldwide, Philadelphia Control Systems programs, software, and engineering solutions deliver optimal performance and output flow with a record that can't be matched. Any plant, any product, any technology. Philadelphia Control Systems, the leader in production automation since 1982. 800-335-9811. PCSforAutomation.com. That's PCS, the number four, automation.com. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We're establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired as I am about the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every week day from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on WNJC Radio 1360 a.m. or around the world on the internet at wnjcradio.com check out our websites conservative commandos radio network.com and ccrn.com for rebroadcasts and network updates we are the conservative commandos radio network where even more newsmakers go to be heard
from the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS Studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our website, ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com, or mornings at 9 a.m., log on to Leading Edge Radio Network. At 1 p.m., log on to roarradio.net, and at 9 p.m., log on to High Plains Daily News. They all end in .com, with the exception of roarradio.net. And you can listen to the conservative commanders from any telephone anywhere on the planet by calling 832-999-1199. Uh, I'm Kevin Wade. It's great to be with you. It's great uh, to be in the studio with Rick on on Monday after the uh, the great blizzard of 16. And uh, Daniel Horowitz is our guest, and he was good enough to stay with us because he was going to introduce a juxtaposition when I interrupted because we had to run some commercial spots. Daniel, thank you for staying with us. Oh, sure. My pleasure. I was just going to go back kind of in, in, in history to understand what the role of the court is and what it is and what, was, what it was supposed to be. What's amazing about the courts is there's there's a two pronged approach here. Number one, they've grabbed power that they never had, meaning they are now the final arbiter over all societal issues. When Alexander Hamilton said they should have neither force nor will, they're mainly there to decide cases and controversies, you know, bankruptcy law, things like that, um, interpret statutes. But even if you're going to abide by this notion of an all-powerful judicial review, the power to rule on the constitutionality of every single federal statute, state laws passed by a state legislature, so then that's the second half. So what is going to be your guide? You have to use the Constitution as it was originally written. But that's not what happened. Not only did the courts use, uh, abuse their power, they use as their guide the Constitution of the legal profession which basically says the Constitution is unconstitutional. What's in it is not in it. What's not in it is enshrined in it. So what I'm saying, what is so, what the powerful juxtaposition is that they strike down state laws pertaining to abortion, marriage, um, criminal justice, stuff that was around at the time the Constitution was adopted, at the time the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868. I mean, most states banned abortion in 1868. So how could you tell me it's a 14th Amendment violation to have such a law? Um, every state defined marriage as a man and a woman, and, and many sta- almost all states even criminalized homosexuality. Whether you agree with it as a matter, matter of policy is a different story, but to say it violates the 14th Amendment is absurd because it, 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 these laws were around when it was written. But then all of a sudden, this all-powerful court that just strikes down these, these foundational state laws, they become impotent when it comes time to strike down laws that are genuinely unconstitutional. For example, I live here in Maryland. Uh, they don't allow anyone to carry any handgun, open carry, concealed carry, and they ban a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of weapons and ammunition even to own in your private home. This is a flagrant violation of the most unalienable right to self-defense expressed in the Second Amendment, and, and yet somehow that's not there. Uh, the courts uphold these laws, and the Supreme Court this term refused to take any of the petitions challenging them, and yet they, they somehow rule that marriage is in the Constitution when it doesn't talk about it. I mean, this is, this is where the courts are. They are a fundamental threat to democracy because... They are ruling our Constitution is unconstitutional, and they are unelected. There is no recourse to even do anything about them. And this is why I believe this is one of the biggest issues for the next GOP presidency. Daniel, you're aware of a movement for what, what is broadly called uh, an Article 5 convention or a, constitution, a convention of the states? 
A- absolutely. I mean, look, you know, Mark Levin's my new boss here. He's the, he's the editor-in-chief of Conservative Review, so uh, I certainly got to say nice things about Article 5. That's his baby. Well, you, you, and, you, you tell him if he ever wants some real radio exposure to come on Conservative Commandos, and we'll give him 30 <laughs> minutes. But uh, what could be done in terms of an Article 5 convention or, or, a, or an amendment proposed by uh, representatives of the states to rein in uh, and out of the control Supreme Court? Sure. So, I mean, what Mark Levin proposed in Liberty Amendments, uh, among a number of amendments, was one to subject them to term limits um, or subject them to election. And, you know, obviously you you really need, look, you need three quarters of the states to sign off on that. that that's very hard. I mean, even Levin calls it a hundred year plan. And, uh, and I do think we, we need to start working on that. You start in your conservative states like Texas and Oklahoma and um, you know, you start growing momentum for it. But I think we need triage even before that. And what I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek. I am almost finished my manuscript. I'm writing a book on this. Stolen Sovereignty is going to be the, the name of the book. A lot of it's about the judiciary. And one of the things I'm going to advocate is invoking Article 3, Section 2. It's straight out. A lot of people forget in a representative republic the people always have the final say. This notion that the courts could just do whatever they want and strike down our sovereignty, you know, some of the immigration stuff we're seeing, releasing criminal aliens, they cannot do that. The legislature has the final say. Article 3, Section 2, they could regulate and exempt the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. There are already laws on the books that have done that to a certain extent. It hasn't been invoked very often. There's no reason they can't do it. It does not require a constitutional amendment the same way you pass anything we want, tax laws, regular, you know, regulatory reform, health care reform. Simply, you know, with the next Republican Senate, Republican president, you could pass a law stripping the courts of jurisdiction over several societal issues and just saying they do not have um, jurisdiction to adjudicate any case that will overturn a laws passed by state legislatures uh, governing abortion or marriage or immigration enforcement. Uh, this is this is indisputable. I mean, it's something they can absolutely do, um, and and it's something we need a national discussion about. And I'm looking forward to kicking off that discussion in the co- in the coming months. Well, I wish you well with that because uh, I, I know, and I think it deserves reminding our audience, reminding our neighbors, that uh, this government only exists by our consent. Governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And too often our team uh, talks to one another in terms of, well, we're not permitted. There's a regulation. There's a statute. We can't, we can't, we can't. No, we can do anything we choose. It just takes a lot of time. And some things are so good that it's worth a lot of time. But when we have justices legislating from the bench completely at odds with the intent of the founders... Uh, we need to find some uh, some counterbalancing influence to uh, to bring some uh, good sense to uh, their conduct. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, some judges in Iowa some years ago who had against the probably the, the sentiments of the state of Iowa. They had ruled sympathetically in favor of a same sex marriage, but Iowa has a provision to recall judges, and all three were recalled in the next election never to darken the doorway of a uh, state court chamber again. And uh, that very quickly sent a message to every other state judge in in that state uh, to keep their rulings in line with the wisdom and uh, and interest sentiments of the everyday folks there. And I think we need to do something like a recall uh, of a federal judge at any level who has lost the confidence of the people. Sure. I mean, so so here, here's the deal. I, I love that idea, and that's why you have in various state constitutions for state judiciaries, they have that recourse. Most states elect judges um, in some way, or, or the legislature appoints. I mean, th- there's some sort of recourse, either in a retention ballot or term limit or initially electing them. It varies by state, and that's the point. But on a federal level, we don't have that. You would need a con- that you would need a constitutional amendment for. But what I'm saying you do not need a constitutional amendment for is to strip them of jurisdiction over various issues. Congress, look, a lot of people forget in the Judiciary Act of 1789, one of the first things Congress did, 
They established the federal courts. They established the scope of jurisdiction, the size of the courts. The notion that they're all powerful outside of the reach of Congress is absurd. And with um, that, Daniel, we're going to wrap this conversation because we're hard up against the end of the segment. You are always, as you know, welcome back on this show because we love to have a conversation with you. And tell, quickly tell our listeners how to stay current with your writings. Absolutely. If you go to conservativereview.com, my page under Daniel Horowitz, The Conservative Conscience, we cover all the hot-button legislative and now judicial issues of the day. So don't miss a beat. It's all free. It's all informative. And let's take back our republic. Daniel Horowitz, thanks for being with us. Come back soon. Absolutely. Looking forward. We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360, our flagship station in Philadelphia and around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, Rebooting Liberty Radio Network, and AM, FM 24-7. I'm Kevin Wade, joined in the studio by Rick Trader. We're going to be uh, going on strong till about 5 o'clock. You stay with us. We'll be right back. You've heard Paul Deltz playing the music on the Your Music Matters Morning Show. He is also an experienced mortgage loan officer working for U.S. Mortgage Corporation and assists homeowners navigate the reverse mortgage process. If you are finding yourself asking questions whether or not you set aside enough for retirement, Paul can sit down with you, your family, and your financial advisor and discuss how a reverse mortgage may be a valuable resource for your retirement plan. You will be responsible for paying your taxes and insurance, and the reverse mortgage can help with this and other expenses, such as home health care or other untimely bills. Put Paul's 20 plus years of experience to work for you as choosing the right option for your situation can be critical. Call Paul at U.S. Mortgage Corporation at 877-213-9977. That's 877-213-9977. Or go to seniormatters.info for more information. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is a licensed mortgage banker in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and an equal housing lender. NMLS number 3901. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is located at 201 Old Country Road, Suite 140, Melville, New York, 11747. This advertisement applies to first lien mortgages. Paul E. Dilks, NMLS is 485 904. Hi, this is Bob Vine, owner of Bob's Tour Shop in Glassburg, New Jersey. I've had the opportunity to travel in many foreign countries, and I've seen what happens to people when they lose their freedom. I wrote this poem. Give us freedom was the cry as they marched throughout the night at Concord Bridge in Trenton for freedom they would fight. To build a nation that would last with peace and liberty, it is a job that's never done if we are to be free. They wrote a declaration to announce that we are free, then a constitution for all the world to see. But this is ink on paper. We must make it last. It must always be defended, and that is quite a task. Today the battle rages for freedom in our land. To save our constitution, we all must take a stand. We must stand up for freedom in our actions every day and you can stand up with us join the nra this is bob biden of bob's little sports shop in glassburg new jersey you may call us at area code 856-881-7575 or visit us online at bob's little sports shop.com what does it take to be the leader in production systems technology? To be the one company that solves production problems at any plant, for any product, and with any technology? It takes a 30-year record of success. It takes total mastery of complex technologies with a history of delivering success every time, without fail. Only one company can claim that high ground in manufacturing line optimization, data automation, and systems integration, and that's Philadelphia Control Systems. In factories worldwide, Philadelphia Control Systems programs, software, and engineering solutions deliver optimal performance and output flow with a record that can't be matched. Any plant, any product, any technology. Philadelphia Control Systems, the leader in production automation since 1982. 800-335-9811. PCS4Automation.com. That's PCS, the number four, automation.com. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We're establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired as I am about the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? 
Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on WNJC Radio 1360 a.m. or around the world on the Internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our website, conservativecommandosradionetwork.com and ccrn.com for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where even more newsmakers go to be heard. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Thank you, Colonel West. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our website, ccrsnetwork.com ccrshow.com or mornings at 9 a.m. log on to Leading Edge Radio Network or at 1 p.m. log on to www.roarradio.net and at 9 p.m. log on to High Plains Daily News and of course you can listen to the conservative commandos from any telephone on the planet by simply calling 832-999-1199. Hey Rick I understand our next guest is up would you please uh Take uh, take the introduction and lead the interview. Absolutely. And uh, joining us here on the Conservative Commandos radio show is Carmine Sabia Jr., who actually started his own professional wrestling business at the age of 18. He went on to become a real estate investor. And currently, he is a pundit who covers political news and current events at BizPack Review. He's also the host of Parabellum which is heard here on WNJC 1360 at 5 p.m. on Monday as part of the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. Carmine, welcome back to the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. Hey, Rick, what's going on? Great to have you with us, my friend. Pleasure Car- to be here. Carmine, I know you're snowed in up there in somewhere in North <laughs> Jersey, but you did have your your pen out, or I said you should say your computer, and you wrote a very interesting piece. And we've asked you to join us today to talk about it. And it's about a United Kingdom company slammed for making refugees wear red wristbands in order to get three meals a day. Now, unbelievable. It is. Call me crazy, but I would think that getting three meals a day, being accepted into this con- to a country who would give them three Three hots and a cot. Uh, what's the grape? And they gave them the cot, too. Yes. They're living in hotel conditions. Now, I'll tell you, Rick, two and a half feet of snow, and when you work from home, you don't even get a day off for that. <laughs> so that's uh, one of the drawbacks, right? But uh, So I wrote this uh, wrote this piece today. Uh, and it's going on. It's the Clear Springs Ready Homes, which is a private company, uh, contracted by the British government to provide um, refugees or asylum seekers with... with um, with um, what's the word I'm looking for? With with, with shelter and food, mm-hmm. um, and they were contracted by the government. So the, the Clear Spring says, "Hey, listen, we need you guys to wear these red wristbands because, for the obvious reason of, well, English citizens could come over and say, hey, 'Hey, I'm a refugee, and they can get three free meals a day.' Yeah, and everybody could do it because there's no way to identify them. So these guys come out and like, I can't believe they're making us do this. They're making us feel different." We had to walk down the street in heavy traffic, and people would honk their horns at us and say, go back to your country. And I had an argument with one of these guys on Twitter. I got an argument with one of these guys you on did. Twitter after my piece came out. You he, did. You on. personally did. I personally did. After the piece came out today, and he, he attacked me, and he said, listen, you don't know what it's like. You know, we, gotta, we feel different than everybody else. I said, I bet it sure beats the heck out of having your head lopped off, though. 
Are you serious? You, you want to talk about wearing a red wristband? And you want to talk about the hellhole, piss-pot country you came from where they're killing people, burning people in the streets, stoning people? And you talk about wearing a red wristband? Yeah. Seems uh, Carmine, it seems to me a lot of righteous indignation. And, you know, let's talk about these wristbands because I'm sure everyone has worn them from time to time. You know, if you go to Wet n' Wild, you have to wear a wristband to show that you paid an entrance fee to go on to the rise. I think you know, down, at, at wrestling shows, you, you pay your admission, you get a wristband. Yeah, and in fact, the other day I had, well, not the other day, but a couple of weeks ago, I was in a hospital, and I was wearing a wristband, and that signified that I had come through proper channels, that I had registered, that they knew me, where I was going, um, gee, I guess I should have been insulted the fact that uh, they're making me wear a wristband. You should file a lawsuit. Well, in fact, you mentioned lawsuits. Have these people, in fact, filed lawsuits? These I have people. Not, I have not heard of lawsuits yet, but I mean, you, you and I both can see which way the wind is blowing here. Yeah. Lawyers are going to jump all over this. Now, when you're when you're talking about refugees. Carmine, could you be more specific? Where are these refugees coming from? I can't be more specific because technically they could be from anywhere, but they right. seem to be from the story and the research I did. Mm -hmm. But there could be there could be there could be refugees from Mexico there for all I know. But the the general the majority seem to be from the Middle East and North Africa. The Sudan uh, places like that. So, you know, Muslim Islamic countries where if you, you know, there are a woman driving, you might get killed. They won't give you a, they'll give you a red wristband around your throat and they'll hang you from it. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you were talking, you were mentioning, and also you mentioned in the story, these people claim that walking down the street, people were honking their, honk, honking their horns, mm -hmm. telling them to go back to their, to where they came from, Who's to say, Carmine, that it was because of the red wristband or maybe some other style of clothing that they were wearing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that it's we the thing, right? Yeah. See a bunch of people in turbans walking down the street. The red wristband might not be the giveaway. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about a wristband here. We're not talking about some kind of a tattoo on the forehead. I'm sure if they were really embarrassed by this wristband, they could... Cover it up with the sleeve of the shirt. Ah. Sure, at this time of the year in Great Britain, they're not going to be walking around in t-shirts. I'm sure they're wearing jackets. You know, this seems to be a lot of. Thing is, Rick, it's the thing. I wrote another piece today. Okay. Yeah. I wrote another piece today, very similar in tone. There's these refugees in France. I don't know if you heard about it. They took over a port in a French city, okay. and these refugees. Now there was about twenty of a group in Britain called No Borders that went with these refugees. They take over this port, and there's hundreds of refugees, about 20 people from the group No Borders. And the reason I'm telling you that is it's, it's important for the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. so about 500 refugees, about 20 people from the group No Borders. They take over the town. They terrorize this one family in their home, throwing garbage at them and this and that, cursing them, calling them Nazis. And this one guy comes out with a rifle, and all of a sudden these 500 refugees weren't so tough anymore. Now they're saying, I'm sorry, and this and that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but... And then meanwhile, 500 terrorizing families, they get onto a British boat, they start uh, damaging it, they take a, a statue of Charles de Gaulle, they deface it. All of these, these, are, these are Obama's orphans and widows. Yeah. Okay? Well, Carmine, uh, we, from what we're beginning to understand, these are not isolated incidents. No. I mean, we've heard the stories of what happened New Year's Eve in Cologne, Germany, where right. women were sexually harassed and sexually abused and there were some rapes involved uh, so this is this doesn't seem to be an isolated incident and Carmen it seems to me these people are not looking to assimilate in in the society of what they're coming but they want to be separate unique and distinct from the society that they're coming into Correct. Well, it's interesting. But let me finish my story. So I'm sorry. I mean, no, no, it's okay. So they deface um, a thing of Charles, a statue of Charles de Gaulle, the former French president, as well. And so the, the French politicians are outraged. They are outraged that 500 refugees 
and 20 people from No Borders in Britain came and did this to their community. But who were they outraged at? Where are they placing the blame? They're placing the blame at the 20 people from No Borders who came and, 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 and helped the refugees. Not the 500 refugees. They don't get the blame. The blame goes to the, to the white people, essentially, with No Borders. So, you know, the British citizens... And so these, these, if, you, if you follow me on bizpackreview.com, these situations are not isolated. They, it's a common occurrence. I write about it almost every day. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is people need to wake up, Rick, before it gets to this country. You know, people like me that are pundits, we do this for a living. You know, most people have their day-to-day job. Mm-hmm. They come home, maybe they watch 10, 20 minutes, maybe an hour of the news, and they go to bed or they eat their dinner, whatever they do. But me, people like me and you... We eat this, sleep this, breathe this, drink this. This is every minute of every day for us. Yeah. And you know, Carmine, there, there, there's two solutions to this problem. Number one, if they don't like wearing the wristband, if they don't like getting three meals a day, if they don't like being put up in places, and as you described it here in your article, hotel-style conditions, they can do either one of two things. Either they can go back home, Mm-hmm. the place where they came from, or they can get a job. But you're wrong, Rick. Oh, I'm wrong. Third option. Okay. And it's the option that's being taken. And in traditional European style, the style Obama is modeling us after, you can cave into the refugees and do what they tell you to do. That's the style that they're going to take. Now, what do you mean by caving in? What has happened? They're, they got rid of the red wristbands. No more red wristbands. No more red wristbands. So, do is there a card that they have to show, or who knows? Who knows? Whatever I guess they, I guess whatever they're willing to do, because they're the ones calling the shots. Hey, Carmine, we have to take a quick break. Could you hold her for just two Absolutely. minutes, for us, please? All right. You are listening to the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with Kevin Wade and Rick Trader coming to you from the studios of the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. Here at WNJC 1360 in Philly and around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, Rebooting Liberty Radio, AM FM 24-7, and a whole bunch of others. Our guest this segment is Carmine Sabia Jr., and we're talking about how refugees seem to be a little bit, what should we say, ungrateful? Be right back. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We are establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired of the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 on your AM dial, or around the world on the Internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our website, CCRSNetwork.com, for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where now even more newsmakers go to be heard. Hi, this is Bob Vide, owner of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassburg, New Jersey. I've had the opportunity to travel in many foreign countries, and I've seen what happens to people when they lose their freedom. I wrote this poem. Give us freedom was the cry as they marched throughout the night at Concord Bridge in Trenton for freedom they would fight. To build a nation that would last with peace and liberty, it is a job that's never done if we are to be free. They wrote a declaration to announce that we are free, then a constitution for all the world to see. But this is ink on paper. We must make it last. It must always be defended, and that is quite a task. Today the battle rages for freedom in our land. To save our constitution, we all must take a stand. We must stand up for freedom in our actions every day and you can stand up with us join the nra this is bob biden of bob's little sports shop in glassford new jersey you may call us at area code 856-881-7575 or visit us online at bob's little sports shop.com from the east coast to the west coast and around the world on the internet 
We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Thank you, Colonel West. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our website, ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com. Or mornings at 9 a.m., log on to Leading Edge Radio Network. Or at 1 p.m., log on to RoarRadio.net. And at 9 p.m., log on to High Plains Daily News. And you can listen, as you know, to the Conservative Commandos Radio from any telephone on planet Earth by calling 832-999-1199. I'm Kevin Wade in the studio with Rick Trader, and we've got a guest. I'd like you to pick up the conversation. Okay, here on Conservative Commandos, we're speaking with Carmen Sabia, Jr. He's a writer for BizPack Review. He's also the host of Parabellum, excuse me, Carmine, which is heard here on WNJC 1360 at 5 p.m. on Mondays as part of the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. Carmine, thanks for uh, holding through the break. We appreciate your time. Hey, no problem, man, no problem. Happy to do it. Well, you also have another article I wanted to bring to our listeners' attention. Again, it's a Muslim activist and author who thinks it's time for Muslims to be represented in outer space as part of Star Wars. Tell us about that story. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my faves. Um, so this guy, you know what, I don't remember his name at the current, the current moment, but um, his gripe was there was not a Muslim a Jedi in Star Wars. And so in order to combat Islamophobia, uh, we had to have a Muslim Jedi. And I, again, this is another guy. I'm, I, I think you know I'm not a shy wallflower. It's another guy I I took it to on Twitter after I wrote the article, and I, and I had a little tete-a-tete with him. You did? I did. And, and um, go, Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish the story. Well, and Yeah, I mean, so, so here his stance is, you know, there needs to be a Muslim Jedi. And my stance is, there's no religion represented in Star Wars, uh, unless you consider Jedi a religion. And, you know, a, a Muhammad somebody, and, and I, I guess you could do it, but it would be pandering. It's stupid. Because um, Muhammad is a deeply religious name. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and um, so the, the argument goes that it would help combat Islamophobia, and I told him, I said, you know, a better way to combat, and I said it in the article, a better way to combat Islamophobia might be using your, your bully pulpit to denounce the the horrible acts committed in the name of your religion rather than whining about a Muslim Jedi. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he took exception to that, and we went back and forth. But he's a, he's what you call one of those liberal intellectuals, you know, thinks you're smarter than everybody, you know the type. Well, is he himself a Muslim? Yes. Okay, so... I, I would have said the same thing to him you did, Carmine. You want to you wanna combat Muslim Muslimophobia, whatever the word you come up with. Uh, Got to become part of the part of the society of what you're coming into. You know, there's we've uh, we've been talking. Well, there's stories now. There's parts of France you you a uh, a Frenchman cannot go into because it's been taken over by the Muslims. And uh, from what I understand, there are parts in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I mean, you don't get much more American than Minneapolis, Minnesota, but there are parts of Minneapolis that Christians and Jews and and non, non-denominational type people can go into because they're not Muslim. Correct. They're called no-go zones. No-go zones. So you had uh, some back and forth with on Twitter with this individual. And, you know, uh, uh, one question that I'd have, if there was a Muslim Jedi, I'm sure he wouldn't be wearing a red band on his wrist, would he? <laughs> Probably not. Unless he wanted three free meals a day. Yeah. i tell you what, I'll wear a red wristband for three free meals a day. <laughs> I bet you have. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm doing it right now. Just kidding. All right, so where did you leave it with him? Are you still debating the issue with him? What, and what are our other people on Twitter entering this conversation with you yeah. and with him? Well, I mean, they're going to listen. They're going to agree with him, right? Unless they're followers of mine. Um, but most people, you know, we're, we're his people, and they agree with him. And that's cool. Mm-hmm. Listen, I don't, I don't go back and forth all day with these people because they have nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. They will go back and forth all day. I have other things to do. I mean, I get, I get attacked by A-list celebrities on Twitter, so I don't have really too much time for these people. Um, so, I mean, you know, we, we went back and forth, and, you know, it ended. But it, it, it ended with I fired the final blow, and he had no comeback. You know, which was you could always go back to your country. Why don't you go back? Was There's he, no answer to that question. Was this individual? Where was this individual living? Well, he claimed to be one of the people. He, he claimed to be one of what people? One of the people with the red wristbands. Oh, oh, oh! I see. So this individual who said that we need a Muslim Jedi was one of the people that. Oh no 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 no! Two different people. Two different people. Okay. Oh, this guy's got money. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you know about him? Uh, he's an author and a professor and like a... Right. Well, there you go, Carmine. Why don't he write his own book? He his, should. His own f- science fiction book. And he can have predominantly Muslims in this story if he should so want to. You know what, Rick? I wish I talked to you before. That's a great... Uh that's a great idea. Yeah, and, and he can write whatever kind of book he want. He could make Muslims look wonderful in his book or in his story. And, and who knows? May, you say he's got a lot of money. Maybe well, he, he can Wars. produce his own movie and he could call it Muslim Star Wars or something. Yeah, well, I probably can call it that. You call it Jihad Wars or, uh, I don't know, uh, Pork Wars. Pork mm-hmm. Wars is good. Yeah. <coughs> Carmine, uh, as I... As I've been talking here, I mentioned that you are the host of Parabellum. Would you tell our audience a little bit about that show? Well, it's a great show. <laughs> you get to hear more of me. And it is, uh, it's myself, Eric Talai, who uh, appears regularly on uh, the Blaze Radio, mm-hmm. and Charles R. Patrick, famous for his Pull Your Pants Up Challenge. Mm-hmm. And uh, we go on every Monday at 5 p.m. right here on your favorite radio network, 1360 AM, Philly. And uh, we talk about conservative topics, man. We talk about, um, you know, what's going on in the world. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring up a lot about these articles today. We'll bring up about some other things. I uncovered something about uh, our good friend uh, Donald Trump today that I think is going to shock some people. You know, care to talk about that? Sure. Uh, we uncovered, t- we, a friend of mine actually, uh, and showed it to me, uncovered a tweet today from Donald Trump. One year, one year and one month ago, uh-huh. December of 2014. So we're not talking about a long time ago. And it says, uh, Al Sharpton loves Trump because he knows I get him. Others don't. Check out the picture. There's a picture of Trump and Sharpton. Now, there was a lot of fake Donald Trump pictures and fake Donald Trump tweets going around. So we looked at it. Mm-hmm. Go right to Donald. You click on the thing. I shared it. You click right on the tweet. It's, a, it's an official Donald Trump verified Twitter account. It's his tweet. Him and Sharpton, side by side, big smiles, and he's bragging about how he gets Al Sharpton. And this is my issue with Trump. I know a lot of your listeners probably are probably Trumpkins. You know, they love the Trump. And that's fine. I'm a Ted Cruz guy, but that's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll support whoever the GOP nominee happens to be. If it's Trump, I'll support him. But when you look at the history of the man, I don't just listen to what a man says, hey, that's why I get paid to do this, because I'm a professional. I don't just listen to what the man says today. I research his history. I research his ties to the Clintons, his ties to many liberal organizations, ties to Planned Parenthood, ties to Al Sharpton. These are things I look at, and I say, how sincere is this guy today? Mm-hmm. How sincere is he? You're hobnobbing with Al Sharpton, and now I'm supposed to believe you're going to be a different beast than Obama? Hey, Carmine, we only have about another minute, so I wanted to get this in real quickly. We're seeing sure. a lot of references to Donald Trump having a lot of association with associations with Democrats, with liberals, pictures, posts, whatever, donations. Very right. few to Republicans or conservatives. Right. And that's what has me concerned about this. Very country. scary. Carmine Zebia Jr., want to thank you for joining us here on Conservative Commandos Radio Show. Please tell our audience how they could follow your writings and also your radio show. 
Sure. So check me out at biztacreview.com. That's B-I-Z-P-A-C, review.com. Follow me on Twitter, at Carmine Sabia, or on Facebook, Carmine77. You can follow me there. Uh, you can't friend me. I'm booked up, but you can follow me. Uh, and definitely one half hour from now, tune in, 1360 AM. We will be a live Parabellum Radio. Tune in, listen. All right. Carmine C.B. Jr., we want to thank you so much for joining us on Conservative Commando's radio show. We'll be talking with you and listening to you very shortly, my friend. Thank you, Rick. Have a great one. Take care. God bless. God bless. To the Commando's Radio Network Studios, WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia and around the world on the Internet with it. American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, Rebooting Liberty Radio, and AM slash FM 24 slash 7. I'm Kevin Wade, joined by Rick Trader. Coming up into the last segment of the first show of the week, you stay with us. We will be right back. You've heard Paul Delt playing the music on the Your Music Matters Morning Show. He is also an experienced mortgage loan officer working for U.S. Mortgage Corporation and assists homeowners navigate the reverse mortgage process. If you are finding yourself asking questions whether or not you set aside enough for retirement, Paul can sit down with you, your family, and your financial advisor and discuss how a reverse mortgage may be a valuable resource for your retirement plan. You will be responsible for paying your taxes and insurance, and the reverse mortgage can help with this and other expenses, such as home health care or other untimely bills. Put Paul's 20 plus years of experience to work for you as choosing the right option for your situation can be critical. Call Paul at U.S. Mortgage Corporation at 877-213-9977. That's 877-213-9977. Or go to SeniorMatters.info for more information. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is a licensed mortgage banker in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and an equal housing lender. NMLS number 3901. U.S. Mortgage Corporation is located at 201 Old Country Road, Suite 140, Melville, New York, 11747. This advertisement applies to first lien mortgages. Paul E. Dilks, NMLS is 485 904. Hi, this is Bob Biden, owner of Bob's Little Shop in Glassburn, New Jersey. I've had the opportunity to travel in many foreign countries, and I've seen what happens to people when they lose their freedom. I wrote this poem. Give us freedom was the cry as they marched throughout the night at Concord Bridge in Trenton for freedom they would fight. To build a nation that would last with peace and liberty, it is a job that's never done if we are to be free. They wrote a declaration to announce that we are free, then a constitution for all the world to see. But this is ink on paper. We must make it last. It must always be defended, and that is quite a task. Today the battle rages for freedom in our land. To save our constitution, we all must take a stand. We must stand up for freedom in our actions every day, and you can stand up with us. Join the NRA. This is Bob Biden of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassburn, New Jersey. You may call us at area code 856-881-7575 or visit us online at bobslittlesportshop.com. What does it take to be the leader in production systems technology? To be the one company that solves production problems at any plant, for any product, and with any technology? It takes a 30-year record of success. It takes total mastery of complex technologies with a history of delivering success every time, without fail. Only one company can claim that high ground in manufacturing line optimization, data automation, and systems integration, and that's Philadelphia Control Systems. In factories worldwide, Philadelphia Control Systems programs, software, and engineering solutions deliver optimal performance and output flow with a record that can't be matched. Any plant, any product, any technology. Philadelphia Control Systems, the leader in production automation since 1982. 800-335-9811. PCSforAutomation.com. That's PCS, the number four, Automation.com. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We're establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired as I am about the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? 
Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on WNJC Radio 1360 a.m. or around the world on the Internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our websites, ConservativeCommandosRadioNetwork.com and CCRN.com for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where even more newsmakers go to be heard. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet. We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 856-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our website, ccrsnetwork.com. And ccrshow.com. Our mornings at 9 a.m. log on to Leading Edge Radio Network or at 1 p.m. log on to RoarRadio.net. And at 9 p.m. log on to High Plains Daily News.com. And now you can listen to the conservative commandos from any phone by calling 832 999 1199. That's 832 999 1199. And Rick, uh, do we have our. Final guest up? Yes, we do. Okay. Chancellor Charles Modica, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that final name. We'll find out in a second. Uh, is Chancellor and Chair of the Board of Trustees of St. George's University, a university he founded in 1977 in Granada, West Indies, as an independent school of medicine. In fact, I think one of the, uh, the uh, surgeons who uh, dealt with me when I was having my uh, perforated appendix graduated from that good school. Uh, that was in July. Uh, in the years since, Dr. Modica guided its development into an international center of higher education. As ambassador at large for Granada, Dr. Modica has worked to promote the country's infrastructure in health industry, business, and tourism. He has a strong sense of civic responsibility and currently serves the Granada Heart Foundation the Vincentian Children's Heart Fund, and as co-chair of the fund for the orphans and elderly of Granada. And uh, with that, let me welcome, and I believe this is for the first time, to the Conservative Commandos Radio Show, Chancellor Charles Modica. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a privilege to be uh, aboard on your show and uh, certainly to discuss some of the uh, uh, things that are going on here in the United States that uh, are involving some of our graduates, and that, that is the primary care physician shortage that exists now in the United States, and um, we'll uh, probably get up to about 65,000 physicians short by 2025, which is, as we all know, <laughs> coming up pretty shortly, less than a decade, so it, it's uh, a, a pleasure to be with you and uh, certainly talk, hopefully talk about that that phenomenon because we, we are in a country that needs more and more primary care physicians here in the United States. And um, uh, we find that the St. George's University in Grenada, ironically, is producing more primary care physicians for the U.S. market for the last five years than any other single medical school in the world. That's including the U.S. schools. Um, we're proud of that, but at the same time, it makes us recognize the fact that Indeed, it shouldn't be simply a St. George's University phenomenon to producing that number of positions that are needed here back here in the United States. What is driving, uh, in fact, I'm just double checking, yeah, Dr. Santoro, Peter Santoro was a graduate of your uh, fine institution, and uh, he helped me through a, about a very painful appendicitis this summer. Uh, what is driving the shortage in, in, in general practice uh, physicians? 
I think, the, the, unfortunately, the economic realities of medicine have been such that surgeons, like uh, a recent graduate uh, that you've had a positive experience with, who are doing a wonderful job, and neurosurgeons and all sorts of special, uh, specialty-trained uh, physicians are doing wonderful jobs, but the lure of those specialties have created a little bit of a vacuum in primary care. A lot of physicians in medical school and certainly in residency programs uh, tend to gravitate towards those specialty training areas, and then once they graduate those residency programs, uh, uh, certainly practice within those specialties. So uh, a lot of the economic reality is that primary care physicians don't generally achieve the salary levels of the specialty care physicians. And, and that's why the, uh, the, the marketplace really has dictated that some of the most important physicians we'll ever encounter are uh, primary care physicians because they're the ones that sometimes can push the panic button that we didn't know needed to be pushed in our health care. And what, has this always been a problem that, that physicians would be drawn to the, to the specialties and, and away from general practice, or is this just an amplification of something that's been going on uh, recently? That's a good question. I, I think that it's always been a, a trend, obviously, but it's accelerated recently. Uh, a lot of that, I think, is due, unfortunately, to Obamacare and some of the aspects that have led physicians to want to get into specialty training so that they could continue to earn the salaries uh, and income levels that they really had worked very hard to achieve. And, and certainly they put many years of study and a very low paying residency uh, program in front of them before they can practice. A, a, a surgeon, for instance, would have four years of medical school after four years of college and then another three or four years in uh, surgical specialty training so you've, you've had someone that's given up a good portion of his or her life uh, in medicine, and they're not about to, to succumb to a lower salary, salary level that, that's dictated by primary care needed physicians with the, uh, the current health care system that we unfortunately have. So in the practice of especially, you have a little bit more, you have more options in terms of uh, your procedures and, and, and what you charge in comparison to uh, the heavy hand of, uh, of a price sheet controlled by Obamacare and uh, the bureaucrats? That's the unfortunate reality that physicians are facing right now. And it's only a year or two of extra training than a primary care physician would need. So that's why they tend to gravitate towards those specialties. And it's understandable, obviously, and that, when you look at it from their point of view. What what can be done to uh, to restore the balance? Because I really don't want to see a surgeon first. I'd rather see someone who I've been seeing for five years, who, who knows my health history and my lifestyle and what my interests are. Well, yeah, that's a good question. One of the things, it was ironic to me, certainly, to learn that St. George University in Grenada is producing more primary care physicians than any other single school in the world, when you think about it. But I think one of the reasons we've succeeded in that is we've given a lot of scholarship money for people that are indicating early on that that reason they want to become a physician is they want to practice primary care. We hope they, uh, when they enroll, obviously, we hope that they will fulfill that dream and not go back on it. But in the case of certain scholarship programs, like in the city of New York, we have a program with the Health and Hospitals Corporation of the city of New York, which runs all the public hospitals there, as you know. And uh, with that program, we just gave out, I think, $1.8 million worth of scholarships uh, just in the past few weeks for the entering class that are coming from New York City. Uh, and those people have promised and pledged that they will go back and practice primary care in those very city hospitals where they have resided near uh, for the many years of their own lives. So that's kind of a, a small way of starting to accelerate our ability to continue to do that. We've had that scholarship program in for a number of years now, and we're trying to do that with other jurisdictions. But again, that's, that's uh, assuming that the graduate will fulfill that promise. Uh, we think in many cases, or most cases, in the past they have. Uh, certainly that's a way to help build the numbers of them, by having them self-select early on and make that commitment and stick to it. Is, is one of the bottlenecks simply a lack of seats in, in med school? It has been, and that, that's why the U.S. medical schools hadn't expanded enrollment in many, many decades up till about 10 or 15 years ago. And then all of a sudden, there were literally no new, new, new U.S. schools for decades. And uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, 
They started expanding class size and numbers of schools. And one would have thought that now, finally, the primary care physician shortage would get better instead of worse. But what's happened is it's produced more people that want to go into specialty training. So I think that one of the real answers would be the continuation of the projects that we've had where U.S. schools also offer scholarship aid to students and applicants who want to indicate that they will practice primary care in certain underserved locations and get them ahead of time when they're really uh, trying to get into med school. As you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult to get into med school. Only about one in four applicants are accepted. And with that, um, you can ask those to self-determine who would be really interested in primary care and willing to go, to go into primary care uh, for a lifelong uh, dream of practicing medicine. Uh, Chancellor Modica, would you stay with us? We're going into a hard break, but I would like to continue this on the other side if you would uh, agree to continue the conversation. I would love to. And also, uh, while we're on the break, uh, could you give us some idea of how many new uh, family practice physicians are, are, are created every year and, and what the shortfall is and, and outline some strategy to uh, resolve this long term? Okay. Um, well, the, the numbers of family now, practice... That's on, the other si- that's on the other side of the break. Okay, well, stay sorry. with us. We'll, oh, we'll pick it up then. Okay. Sure, sure, okay. <laughs> We're coming to you live from the Conservative Commanders Radio Network studios. Uh, audience, that was just a tease. That's why we want you to stay with us. WNJC 1360 AM, our flagship station in Philadelphia, and around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, Rebooting Liberty Radio, and AM slash FM 24 slash 7. I'm Kevin Wade. With me in the studio is Rick Trader. And uh, staying with us to extend this interview is Chancellor Charles Modica. And we're going to talk about what we can do to improve access to family care physicians here in this country. Stay with us. I really don't care. That's my good They say unless he to the world. Well, I think we can all agree that we need to The Conservative Commandos Radio Show is expanding to become the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. We are establishing a front line of conservative radio broadcasters and ironclad patriots to declare war against the madness of liberalism and the Obama administration. Are you tired of the disregard for our Constitution? Do you still have faith in the American dream? Are you looking for sensible, smart radio? If so, listen to the Conservative Commandos Radio Network every weekday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on WNJC Radio, 1360 on your AM dial, or around the world on the Internet at WNJCRadio.com. Check out our website, CCRSNetwork.com, for rebroadcasts and network updates. We are the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, where now even more newsmakers go to be heard. Hi, this is Bob Vide, owner of Bob's Little Sports Shop in Glassburg, New Jersey. I've had the opportunity to travel in many foreign countries, and I've seen what happens to people when they lose their freedom. I wrote this poem. Give us freedom was the cry as they marched throughout the night at Concord Bridge in Trenton for freedom they would fight. To build a nation that would last with peace and liberty, it is a job that's never done if we are to be free. They wrote a declaration to announce that we are free, then a constitution for all the world to see. But this is ink on paper. We must make it last. It must always be defended, and that is quite a task. Today the battle rages for freedom in our land. To save our constitution, we all must take a stand. We must stand up for freedom in our actions every day and you can stand up with us join the nra this is bob biden of bob's little sports shop in glassford new jersey you may call us at area code 856-881-7575 or visit us online at bob's little sports shop.com from the east coast to the west coast and around the world on the internet We're coming to you live from the CCRS studios, WNJC 1360. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. You can call the Conservative Commandos Radio Show at 
256-227-1360. Your opinion counts at 856-227-1360. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Thank you, Colonel West. If you'd like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, please check out our websites, ccrsnetwork.com, ccrshow.com, or mornings at 9 a.m., log on to Leading Edge Radio Network at 1 p.m., roarradio.net, R-O-A-R, radio.net, and at 9 p.m., log on to High Plains Daily News. They all end in .com, with the exception of Roar Radio. And you can listen to the Conservative Commandos from any phone on the planet, by calling 832-999-1199. On the phone with us is Chancellor Charles Modica. And uh, he's Chancellor and Chair of the Board of Trustees of St. George's Medical School. I'm probably going to misstate this in the wrong way, but uh, down in Grenada. And, and he's, he's come up with some ideas. First of all, he's pointing a light, shining a light on the fact that we don't have enough general practice, ge- physicians, family doctors, and uh, he has been working out some band-aids to a bigger problem. And I asked him to think about what is, what is the bigger solution. So, Chancellor Modica, thanks for staying with us. Uh, what can our nation do uh, to solve the bigger problem? Well, I think the, the, uh, as a nation, we have to recognize the value of primary care physicians and make sure that in the future they continue to be uh, uh, compensated in an appropriate way for people that have spent their lives uh, studying in college, in medical school, and then in a residency program. And instead of having maybe half or a third of the income, uh, a surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or uh, even a dermatologist would later on, just by spending an extra couple of years in a residency program, uh, they need to be uh, drawn closer to their classmates' income uh, capabilities. Um, it's not all about money, but it certainly shouldn't punish the, the graduate who wants to become a primary care physician. And the only way we're able to get more in our class in the primary care mode is to give scholarship aid in advance to help them and hope they'll fulfill the commitment. Um, we've been fortunate because about 75 or 76 percent of our graduates are able to go into primary care in many cases because of these kinds of things that we have put in place. Whereas you know, the average U.S. school produces about, uh, in primary care, about 30 or 35 percent at the most, about half of, a, of the rate that we're putting uh, primary care physicians out there. And um, don't forget, family practice differs from primary care. Uh, a primary care physician could be a pediatrician um, uh, as, as well as a family practice doc as well as a, uh, uh, a um, obstetrician. So there are certain primary care um, capabilities of, of docs that uh, are um, within the, the spectrum of primary care, whereas family practice is now considered a specialty of its own, but a very low-paying one for physicians. And by 2025, according to some estimates, we're expecting to be short by about 65,000 of these physicians. Yes, that's a, the American Association of Medical Colleges just came out with that number recently, and uh, uh, that that's an extraordinary number when you consider that right now from the U.S. Uh, all the U.S. schools combined, they're only producing about five to six thousand a year right now. So if the shortfall is sixty-five thousand in ten years, you can see they'd have to literally double the number, more than double the number. To take away that shortfall, and uh, which is oh, literally almost impossible right now in the way uh, they're admitting students and not requiring more students to to be uh, predisposed towards a primary care specialty. And, and, and you spoke about the uh, city doctor scholarships program. Uh, what other avenues are open to aspiring uh, uh, family practice doctors in terms of uh, getting some help or assistance in tuition? Uh, versus a commitment to serve one place or another. Are there similar programs? For example, if if, if you agree to go into the military uh, and practice medicine for X years, do you, would you get help with your tuition? Uh, if you agree to yes, work uh, in... You, go ahead. There is a, a program for the military, except that it doesn't necessarily uh, mandate primary care specialties. In many cases, uh, as, as we could well understand, orthopedic surgery and trauma and other things like that are 
needed in the military. And uh, so th for that reason, it's not just centered around primary care. Um, I don't know of any other U.S. schools that have uh, a, the number of scholarships we do for primary care, but I'm sure many, of, if not most of them, have some kind of uh, way of, of uh, gearing themselves up to attract primary care docs initially when they first enroll. The problem is they don't have it extensive enough to reach down into the student's body to get two-thirds of the students coming out desiring primary care, which is the rate they would have to go. Uh, which is double their, more than double their current rate to start to fulfill this uh, gap. What would help your institution to uh, to produce more of these uh, sorely needed skill sets? Uh, I think what we, we're at max capacity to do it right now in terms of scholarships and what have you. Um, but what we do try is to reach out to areas that are underserved and make people aware that St. George's University in Grenada, which is only two years actually down on the island of Grenada. The second two years are in the United States uh, at hospitals like uh, those in the Health and Hospitals Corporation of New York and other cities, as well as the United Kingdom. So we're trying to make the uh, the option available to anyone who really is uh, doing well in college, a serious medical school applicant capability, and willing to consider primary care and letting them know if you're from an underserved area specialty, you will be given preferred status by our admissions committees because they're of the need and, and the success we've had in the past in recruiting primary care physicians that turn out to fulfill that dream. We're coming up in our final minute. Uh, Chancellor Modica, could you tell our uh, listening audience how to uh, maybe get engaged with uh, uh, being on your team and helping to uh, solve some of these problems, uh, to learn more about uh, your, your, your uh, St. George's University and uh, perhaps speak to some of their uh, uh, legislators about uh, getting some legislative help and some financial help for those people who express a willingness uh, to pursue this line of medicine. Sure. Well, uh, our website is a pretty easy one. It's uh, SGU for St. George University, sgu.edu. And um, uh, there uh, on, within the website, uh, certainly are different uh, avenues to explore towards primary care as well as the university itself and some of the programs for scholarship that we have uh, for young men and women who are at, it, presumably in college now or just getting ready to graduate who are ready to uh, look into a real career in medicine and uh, be willing to know that uh, early commitment with any medical school, I think, that are well-intended and sincere will result in an admissions committee looking at that applicant saying that if this person can fulfill a really great need in our society, why not give that that student a, uh, a, a heads up and, and give them a little bit of a chance to work with the uh, medical school committee and to get some real preferential treatment in the admissions uh, process. Chancellor Modica, thank you so much for being with us and thank you for shining a light on this urgent problem. Thank you. Rick, uh, great guest, great show. Great uh, guest. I'm, personally, I'm, I'm thankful that that, that uh, uh, university was was working uh, so effectively down in Grenada that uh, that I had uh, good Dr. Peter at my bedside when I was <laughs> in serious pain, well, running Kevin, high fever. Kevin, I've been to Grenada. There's another reason if somebody is looking to go in the medical field. It's a beautiful place. And you're not going to hit your head from with one to three feet of snow with another storm coming that's for sure it's it's uh oh it's like going to school in paradise another day another day in paradise i don't know whether that would make it easier or make it harder well it depends where your pri where your priorities are and if you're trying to study you know yeah. if you're living in paradise it might be hard to study well you can take your books down onto the beach and study in paradise <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous place. And as I was mentioning to you on the break, Kevin, one of the things I'll never forget about being in Grenada was this was a couple of years after the U.S. invaded Grenada because of the Cubans down there, was there was a mural on the side of, the, on the side of a building that I, I will never forget and said, God bless the 82nd Airborne Division. 
Well, uh, some of our listeners remember that there was some disturbances down there and uh, some con- Cuban construction firms as well as some Cuban soldiers. Yes. And uh, the, the comings and goings uh, and the liberty of, of American students at St. George's yes. at the med school. I remember that one. Uh, was limited. Yeah. They were basically locked up and the United States, led by President Ronald Reagan, didn't want to see a repeat of the uh, terrible embarrassment and uh, humiliation that we experienced in Tehran at the hands of the Iranians. So he took swift action, and what was done was done quickly, and all's well that ends well. And I'm glad to see there was a mural up there. Yep. Hey, Rick, we're coming to the end of the show. Let me uh, let me wrap up by saying it is always a blast to work with you on the microphone. I do enjoy the guests, and more than anything else, I enjoy that our listeners are with us. Uh, I want to thank Mateo for being in the studio, as always. Let me say, my friends, God bless, Godspeed. And may God save the United States of America.